Well, if the number of bacteria and viruses that we've talked about didn't worry you, we've got a whole chapter on all the fungi that can cause diseases in humans. So this chapter, we're going to talk about, you know, just some basics of fungi, how they grow. And we're going to go over some of the true pathogens, meaning the ones that are going to affect even the healthiest individual. Some of the opportunistic pathogens mean they get into somewhere where they're not supposed to or they affect immunocompromised patients. And then some of the superficial or, you know, cutaneous, the ones that are found on the skin, those kinds of uh, fungi. So some basics. One, molds and yeast, we can find them anywhere. We can find spores in air, in dust, on surfaces. You yourself might have part of your normal flora, various types of yeast. Humans in general are relatively resistant to fungal infections, and most are non-pathogenic. There are around 100,000 fungal species, and only 30 or 300 of them have actually been linked disease to diseases in animals and humans. Now, and I'm like, fungi are the most common plant pathogens, so there are a lot of fungi that cause plant issues. But human mycoses, and anything that has MYC, M-Y-C in it means fungus, fungus. So human mycoses, or fungal diseases, are caused by true fungal pathogens and opportunistic pathogens. Now when I say true fungal pathogen, this means that they can grow even in healthy, non-immunocompromised hosts. Now, the interesting part about some of these true fungal pathogens is they have the ability to switch from different kinds of cells. They can go from hyphal cells, almost like the spore form, to a yeast cell, the reproductive, more parasitic phase. And they can do this using temperatures. They can switch back and forth. It's temperature dependent. It's kind of what temperature they are out in the environment versus the temperature in the body. So they grow as molds at 30 degrees Celsius, and then when they get up to 37 degrees Celsius body temperature, they grow as yeast, the more parasitic form. So this is just showing that, you know, natural habitat, they're growing more as spores, but when we breathe in those spores and they get to 37 degrees, then they grow as yeast in the body and they have all of the budding is where they can be spreading inside the body. So I'm like, they, they have this thermal called dysmorphism. It's just the fact that they can go back and forth and it's all temperature dependent. So some of our emerging fungal pathogens that we're seeing more of include some of the opportunistic fungal pathogens um, where they don't really have any virulence factors. You, it means the host has to be immunocompromised. Otherwise, they can also vary from a superficial colonization or they can get in and affect widespread body systems, calling, possibly causing a fatal systemic disease. Now, a big concern now is that fungal diseases are emerging in healthcare settings. And so fungal pathogens count for about 10% of all nosocomial infections. So it's not just all the other bacteria and viruses to be worried about. There are fungi that can get picked up while in a healthcare setting. And a big issue is some of these are now becoming resistant to antifungal drugs, meaning we have nothing left to treat them with, just kind of like how bacteria were running out of different drugs to treat these organisms. And then we're also getting uh, some dermatophytes, ones that normally infect the skin and the, the tissues and the hair, they're transforming into true pathogens, that you don't need to be immunocompromised anymore or get it somewhere where it's not supposed to be. They're turning into true pathogens that even healthy individuals are starting to pick up some of these fungal infections. Now, most fungal pathogens don't require a host to complete their life cycles. And most infections are not communicable, which means they don't need a host. They can complete their life cycle out in the environment if they need to. And these are not communicable diseases. If I have a fungal infection, these are not things that I can cough on you and sneeze on you and you're gonna pick up a fungal infection. So fungal infections are generally not communicable. Some of the skin ones are. So some of the, derma, the dermophytes and candida can be found on the surface of the skin and are transmissible from host to host, but most fungal diseases are not communicable. And a lot of cases go undiagnosed or misdiagnosed 
a lot of the signs and symptoms of fungal diseases resemble a lot of bacteria and viral diseases. And so that's usually where the medical facility I'm like, or the medical staff is usually gonna go straight to bacteria or virus before they start to realize, well, we rule out bacteria, rule out viruses, then they start looking at fungal diseases. Now, true fungal pathogens are distributed in a pretty predictable geographic location. And that's mostly because of the temperature and the soil that these certain pathogens like to grow in. And so you can see, and I'm like, the three continents where most of these fungal pathogens are found. And you can kind of see where we are and which ones we have around here. Other ones are ones that for you to pick up, you would have to travel to different parts of the world. Now, most fungal pathogens get into our body through resp the respiratory system. We breathe them in, we inhale the spores. Again, they are in the air everywhere, we breathe them in. Now, some can get into the skin through any open wound or puncture or trauma, bruise, things like that, but most picked up through respiration, inhalation, and a few of them is just skin-to-skin -skin contact that we can pick them up. Some of those are the cutaneous ones that if one person has it, you can spread it to, to others. And we'll get into some of those like the ringworm that can be spread from skin-to-skin -skin contact. Now, some of these fungi also have some virulence factors that allow them to cause disease. Some have toxin-like substances to get inside the body or into various tissues. They may have capsules or adhesion factors to allow them to cause disease. They might have some enzymes to break things down. They might also have some inflammatory stimulants. Now, our antifungal defenses, again, we're relatively resistant to fungal infections. The skin itself is a great barrier at preventing preventing things from getting in. We also have mucous membranes and respiratory cilia that's there to try to trap these fungus from getting in. Our immune system, our cell-mediated immunity, so our T cells, are at hardest at work with a fungal infection. We all as well as have phagocytosis to try to get rid of them, and we have inflammation to try to increase our immune response to get rid of these fungal pathogens. Now, quick little concept check before I go on. Which phase of a fungal life cycle is best adapted to growing in a host cell? Well, the one that's best adapted to growing in a host body, not cell, in a host body is the yeast. It likes to grow best at 37 degrees Celsius. Now, to diagnose a fungal infection, well, we can microscopically look at, we can stain the yeast cells to look at those spores and try to identify them based on size and shape and where the specimen may have come from. We can grow it in various selective or enriched media. We do have plates that inhibit bacteria from growing but promote fungus from growing. So we can look to see what they look like on plates. Again, some of the fungi look very unique just like bacteria look very unique on different media. We also have other biochemical and serological tests. So we can be looking for very specific um, antibody antigen reactions. We can be looking for specific DNA as well. So there's lots of different ways we can do a diagnosis of a fungal infection. Now controlling fungal infections. Well, we don't have a lot of immunizations or vaccines out there. We're trying to work on some. So right now we do have some work on trying to develop vaccines for coccidiomycosis and histoplasmosis, but your best bet is to avoid getting a fungal infection is having protective clothing, um, wearing masks if you know you're gonna be somewhere where you might inhale some of these spores and just anything to reduce contact with fungal spores. In some cases, surgical removal might be required to remove any fungal damaged tissues to prevent it from spreading from one area to another. Now, we do have antifungal drugs as well. They work different ways. Some of them work on different parts of the actual cell itself. Uh, I'm not gonna go for all of the little groups of them, just a couple that you may see in some of the slides coming up. One of the biggest one, amphotericin B, is a very common antifungal drug. It is toxic and have side, can have side effects, but for some of the life-threatening infections, it really is one of our best antifungals we have. So I'm like Nystatin too, it's also toxic, but it can be used for topical fungal infections. So we've got 
we've got antifungal drugs out there. The problem with antifungal drugs, fungi are eukaryotic cells. Our cells are eukaryotic, so the cells are very similar to each other, which means any drug that targets a fungal cell may have adverse side effects because our cells are similar to it. So it's you know been hard to develop drugs that are specific for these fungi without affecting our own cells, our own metabolism. So I'm like, well, we do have some. Now we organize our fungi into different types of fungi. Are they true pathogens, not true pathogens? What is the level of infection they can cause? What is their degree of disease? You know, where, what part of the body do they infect? We have some true pathogens cause systemic diseases. They can affect any body system. Some are cutaneous, which means they're gonna affect the skin. And some are superficial, which means they're just gonna affect the very, very top surface, barely getting underneath the skin at all. And we also have, not true pathogens, we have opportunistic fungi, which means these are the ones that you have to be immunocompromised before you're gonna pick up one of these. So if you're already healthy, not shouldn't be too worried about opportunistic pathogens, but usually elderly, anyone that's suffering from any other type of diseases, that puts them at high risk of picking up a fungal disease on top of whatever else they might be suffering from. Now, there are four true pathogenic fungi that we're gonna talk about. The histoplasma, the coccidioid, the blastomyces, the paracoccidioids. All of them are picked up through inhalation. So they're first gonna cause a pulmonary infection, but they can then spread through the blood and they can cause infections elsewhere in the body. Sometimes skin infections, sometimes other systemic infections. They're all dimorphic, which means they can change uh, how they react or grow based on if they're in the environment or whether they're in the body. Now our first one, the histoplasma, causes what's known as histoplasmosis, which is also known as the Ohio Valley Fever. It's the most common true pathogen. Now, we can find it worldwide, but here in the United States, it's most prevalent in Eastern and Central region of the United States. So I usually ask students at this point, oh, so do we have it around here? Well, and then usually people are like, oh, no, it, I, Minnesota and Wisconsin are not shaded in purple. However, we do have cases around here now, the purple is where you have the highest number of cases. You're right, we don't have a high number of cases, but we do have a number of cases here in Wisconsin and in Minnesota. This particular fungus, it grows best, it likes moist soils, it definitely likes soils that have a high nitrogen content. Now, a reason why certain soils can have a high nitrogen content if there is a large number of bird and bat poop or guano that's found there. And so caves, where you can have lots of bats and lots of bat droppings, can provide a, ni a great high nitrogen content soil. They also like it a little cooler as well. So I'm like, we do have cases here in Wisconsin and in Minnesota, but there are more cases a little bit farther south of here. Now, how we pick it up, again, we pick it up through inhalation. Sometimes it's just, you know, the bird droppings, there's a breeze, it gets whipped up, we inhale it. Now, again, it first is gonna form some type of lung infection. Now, for some individuals, mild cases, minor cough, maybe asymptomatic. However, it can travel throughout the body. It can cause different issues in the body and different organs, and it may require some type of chemical therapy. It might require that amphotericin B, itraconazole. It may require surgery to remove infected tissue. Um, it can cause severe issues. One of the first symptoms, though, is the fever, hence the Ohio Valley fever. Otherwise, it's that a mild pneumonia, you know, and a fever. So some individuals asymptomatic or mild, some it can develop into more severe cases. Another of our true pathogens is the coccidioids and mitis, which causes coccidiomycosis. So some of these are like the biggest words ever. So if you're ever playing Scrabble and got a whole bunch of letters to get rid of, you could use some of these really big words. 
Now this particular fungus likes to live in more alkaline, a higher pH soil. It usually likes a more drier, hot climate. So in the United States, we find this particular fungus more in the southwestern United States. So Arizona, Southern California. So if you ever travel to those areas, I'm like, you've probably, you know, you know talk to the locals, they'll have heard of this before. Now it's picked up again through inhalation as all of these true pathogens are. This particular fungus creates these large fer spherules in the lung tissue. So it's almost like these big, huge growths where the fungus itself is reproducing and forming lots and lots of, of spores. Now the infection can leave the lungs and it can develop into infections of the skin where you're gonna have lesions of the skin. It can form lesions. I was gonna say, I know I've got another picture. I'm like lesions on the skin. It can form lesions in bones. It can affect the central nervous system. So it's usually picked up again through inhalation. So anyone that's digging around in, door, in dirt and in soil, it encourages the spores to go airborne and encourages then those spores to get in the body if you're in the area that they're doing that. The third of the true pathogen is Blastomyces dermatitis, which causes the North American blastomycosis. And yep, it's around here. So it's a free living species. It's in a large part of the Midwest and the Southeastern United States. Um, just a little picture of what it's, you know, showing the the growths and the spores coming off out in the environment. Again, we pick it up and just inhaling 10 to 100 of the spores themselves, they can convert to yeast, they start to grow in the lungs. Some of the initial symptoms, coughing, fever. Again, you breathed in something and it's growing inside your lung tissue. It, however, can spread, not always, but it can spread and it can cause uh, some cutaneous lesions. They say they, they're, they say they're painless, wart-like lesions, which usually show up on your face, which is not where you want it, and your hands. To me, that looks painful, but they say painless. Um, it can also cause infections of the bone, as well as central or nervous system complications. It's treatable, and Fetiris and B, as well as some of our other azole drugs can be used to treat it. And then our fourth of our true pathogens is the Paracoxidioides brasiliensis, which, another big word, causes mycosis. Now, based on its name, the brasiliensis, it is found more in South America, Brazil, as well as Central America. It's picked up through inhalation. The group that's at highest risk for picking it up are farm workers in Central and South America. They are digging in the dirt, which means they're going to make any spores if they're available to go airborne and they're going to breathe it in. Now, it usually forms lesions on the skin and on the head and along the mucous membranes, as well as some of the other lymphatic organs might be infected. It doesn't normally spread to other body systems. So the farm workers in these parts of the world have and end up having these lesions of their uh, mucous membranes on their head as well as in their skin. Now, most uh, like a lot of cases, may go unnoticed, may be asymptomatic. Um, otherwise, it's treatable. As I'm gonna say, ketoconazole, amphotericin B, as well as some of our sulfur drugs, it's treatable. Now, quick little check before I go on to our some of our subcutaneous, as, as well as some of our uh, skin infections. Does the primary reservoir for coccidioids imitis you know, where would you pick it up? I'm like, and that would be the dry soil. So if you're traveling to Arizona, to Southern California, or you have some dry desert soil, am I like, you're at highest risk for picking up a coccidioids fungus. Now the subcutaneous mycoses, based on their name, is that they get right underneath the skin. So they're not a superficial, so they, but they can get right underneath the skin. They don't usually travel and cause any sus big systemic diseases. Uh, they're usually deposited underneath the skin with pricks or scrapes. They are usually inhibited by our blood temperature. They don't like it when it gets all the way up to 37. They prefer it a little cooler. And most diseases are progressive that you can see a progressiveness to the diseases, which means if you can catch it early, 
you can slow the spread. Now, the most common subcutaneous mycosis is sporothric schenkii, also known as the rose gardener's disease. Now, big reason why roses is they have all of those thorns. So this is a fungus that if those spores can get into those scrapes and open wounds of those scratches and pokes, that's where they get that subcutaneous entrance. Now, it causes the disease sporotrichosis. The interesting part is that it likes to get into the lymphatic system, and anywhere where there's a lymph node, it forms a lesion. So you can actually see lesions forming in a line. And that's just because it's traveling through the lymphatic system. Now, it's completely treatable, and itraconazole is the top treatment for it. It's totally treatable. Um, it's just a note, if you are a big rose gardener if you like roses just note this is a fungus it's around and when you have scrapes you're providing that entry source for anything not just fungus this is just showing the actual fungal spores themselves what they look like underneath the microscope and this would be a really bad case of sporothrix shankii otherwise they don't normally get that bad most of the time you're going in and getting diagnosed right away and getting treated for the fungal parasite now, some of the cutaneous mycoses, which means these are ones that are going to stay on the skin. They, these are fungi that feed on the keratin portion of our skin, our hair, and our nails. Now, they're all called dermatophytoses, so the derm meaning skin. Now, they are also more nicknamed ringworm and tinea. So there are 39 species altogether in the genre Trichophyton, Microsporum, and Epidermophyton. These are all dermophytoses. So these are all fungi that live on the keratin of the skin, the hair, and the nails. So they're all closely related, morphologically similar, and they all cause what we just normally nickname as ringworm. Now, where we find these fungi? Well, humans, animals, and soils are natural reservoirs for the fungi. The hardiness of the spores, if there's any scratches, if there's intimate contact, that can all promote an infection of one of these fungal, one of these fungal parasites. So long infection period is usually followed by some type of inflammation or allergic reaction to the fungal proteins or the fungal the fungus itself. So you're normally going to have some type of inflammation and allergic reaction. Again, this is still a spore that's growing on the skin, the body, your immune system is still realizing there is a foreign object on the surface of the skin that is trying to feed on the keratin of the skin, hair, and nails, leading to that localized inflammation. Now, these are some of the diseases that these dermophytes can cause. Well, you can have ringworm of the scalp caused by tinea capitis. It can cause usually a balding area. You can have ringworm of the beard. So you can have that damage to the tissue on that hair around the beard. You can also have ringworm of the body, the tinea corporis. This is where you get red ring lesions anywhere on the skin. And the top group of individuals that's normally known for having tinea corporis, so the ringworm of the body, are wrestlers. And it's a fun, everyone always thinks it's a parasitic worm infection because it's called ring worm. It's not, it's just the fact that a lot of times it forms these ring patterns, which in sometimes the ring itself, that outer ring is a darker red, so they would think that there was a worm underneath the skin. Not a worm, it's a fungus. That's just the inflammation of the skin reacting to the fungus. You can get ringworm of the groin, the tinea curious. Again, you're gonna have inflammation around the groin or scrotal areas. You can get ringworm of the nails, the tinea unguium. I'm gonna say it wrong, I'm like unguium. Again, it's the nails of your hands, your feet, they start to decolorize, they start to change shape, and they can start to distort. You can also have ringworm of the foot, tinea pedis, or even ringworm of the hand, tinea mana, the manum. And again, when you get things on the feet and on your hands, you are more likely to spread it because you're touching everything laying down spores. If you walk bare feet, you are likely to lay down spores. So this is why they always say if you ever have to shower in a public restroom, wear flip-flops because you don't know 
what kind of fungal infection someone before you had when they walked around barefoot. Now, diagnosing and treating any of these dermatophytes, well, symptoms can be dramatic looking most of the time. I'm like, they don't cause any serious complications. Most of the time they're gonna go in, they're gonna be able to look at the infection itself and diagnose it. Otherwise they can do a skin scraping, look under the microscope and look for a specific fungal spore. If they want, they could try to culture it and grow it up on a specialized media. Treatment, usually some type of topical antifungal agent. So something you're gonna, some type of antifungal cream. However, depending on the fungus you have, you might be given some type of low dose antifungal for years. Fungal infections are not like bacterial infections. Bacteria, you can take an antibiotic, you know, 10 to 14 days and you can kill the bacteria. Fungi are hard to kill. And again, because they are eukaryotic organisms and similar to our cells, the antifungal drugs can be toxic. So it's usually a low dose of antifungal drugs given for a long period of time. Sometimes they do need to remove infected skin tissue and sometimes UV light can also have some benefit in making fungal infections go away quicker. Now, another type of superficial mycoses, so it's a skin infection, but it's not feeding directly on the keratin. It's something known as tinea versicolor. It's caused by a specific fungus known as Malassezia furfur, which I just like the name, it's fun. And this particular fungus messes with melanin production. So it interferes with those melanocytes underneath your skin. And this can either cause a hyperpigmentation, so an overproduction of melanin, or an underpigmentation, uh, so a decrease in melanin production in wherever the fungals, the fungus is. And so you can actually see a modeling of skin where you can see your skin has different colors. That's because that fungus is interrupting that melanin production at those different areas. This is most commonly diagnosed in the summer because when all of a sudden all of your skin starts to tan, it becomes very evident that you have areas of skin that's not tanning. And like in the winter, when all of your skin is as pale as it can possibly be, you might not even know that this fungus is, you know, living on your skin and causing issues with melanin because you're just pale. Uh, it, however, can cause problems in the follicles. It can cause some cases of psoriasis as well as um, dermatitis around the hair follicles as well, where you've got the, se the sebum. Now, Dermo, the dermatophytic fungi, fungi attack the keratin that's found in your skin, nails, and hair. So this is, you know, they're feeding off the keratin. That's what they're living on. Now, some opportunistic fungi that are out there, I'm not gonna go through or describe all of them, but some of the most common opportunistic fungi. So these are ones that the, you, you, all, you have to have some type of predisposing factor. So it has to be able to get into an area where it's not supposed to be found. If you have a weak immune system, so something that causes these bacteria, or not bacteria, fungi to be allowed to take over. Now we're gonna talk about the candida, the aspergillus, and the cryptococcus. So the candida, and there's multiple candida species, the most common is candida albicans. So it's the most common widespread yeast that affects humans. Now, most often infections are short-lived. They're not chronic, you're not gonna have them usually for years, usually affects the skin. And on occasion, it can cause some fatal systemic diseases. Again, that's usually if you are severely immunocompromised, might be if you're suffering from something else. Now, when they grow, depending on where they grow in the body, usually forms an off-white, kind of pasty colony with a yeasty smell to them. Now, some individuals have candida albicans as part of the normal flora in their mouth, in their genitals, in their large intestine, even on your skin. Like one in five carry this particular organism as part of the normal flora. It's kept in check by your immune system. It's kept in check by other normal flora that's found there. But there are times that when conditions are right, it starts to grow out of control. Now, 
about 70% of fungal healthcare associated infections are from candida albicans. And again, depending on where it's growing depends on what kind of infection you have. A vulval vaginal yeast infection is candida albicans and it's gonna get into the female genital area. It can cause discharge, it can cause a smelly odor, it can cause damage in, uh, to the tissue itself. You can have cutaneous candid candidiasis. Anytime you have a moist area of the skin or in burn patients. So cutaneous candidiasis, usually moist areas of the skin. I mean, if you're wearing wet socks all day or sweaty socks all day and never take them off, your feet never get dry. Uh, infants or babies that wear diapers all day and they don't get changed regularly, that moist area provides a great environment for candida albicans. It can also grow in the mouth. It causes what we, I don't know, I'm like diagnose it or call it as thrush. You end up having kind of a thick white growth anywhere on the mouth and the throat. Now, diagnosing and treating it, you can do scrapings. You can look for the budding knee cells. You can look for the little hyphae. We can grow it on different types of media. Uh, treatment, well, we have some topical creams, some antifungals that can try to kill the candida. Otherwise, if it's getting into the body, it's not just a superficial anymore. Amphotericin B or fluconazole. A couple other opportunistic fungi. One is Cryptococcus neoformans, causes cryptococcosis. Now, this is a particular use that inhabits soil, but it really likes pigeon poop. So it's the main reason why they try to keep pigeons off of buildings. That's normally where air intakes are. And if your air intake is intaking pigeon poop, you could be intaking this particular fungus as well. Now, that's fine if you're a healthy individual, but if someone's immunocompromised, so they're suffering from cancer or going through cancer treatments, have diabetes, or have HIV and are in the AIDS stage of an HIV infection, it can cause a lot more severe side effects. So you breathe it in, so you pick it up through inhalation, and it can lead to an infection in the lungs, so cough, fever, and even some growths in the lung tissue but it does like to spread from the lungs and it can cause growths on your skin tissue and it can also get into the meninges of your brain uh, or around the brain in your spinal cord as well as the brain itself. It can be deadly. Rare that it's deadly, but it can be, especially for those that are the most immunocompromised. It's again, why we just try to keep pigeons off of buildings. Now, diagnosing it, we again can look for the budding yeast. We've got different biochemical tests, we've got antibody tests, we've got DNA probes, and it's treat it is treatable. Again, the sooner you can treat, the better. Amphotericin B, fluconazole, is usually if you've got some type of systemic infection. Another of our opportunistic pathogens is the pneumocystis gyrovetsi, which causes pneumocystis pneumonia. So it's, you can have bacteria that can cause pneumonia, you can have viruses that can cause pneumonia, and you can have fungi that can cause pneumonia. Pneumonia is just kind of, I wouldn't like to say it's a, not a disease, because more than one thing can cause it. It's more of a symptom or a syndrome. So this is a fungus that can cause pneumonia, usually in those that have the weakest immune system, so those that are in the AIDS stage of HIV infection. Now, this particular fungus forms secretions in the lungs that block breathing. So you're not gonna be able to have that nice smooth intake of air and exhale. And so it can be fatal if it's not controlled with medication. And we do have some medications. The interesting part about the medications is although this is a fungus, it behaves more like a protozoan. So, they're, it's actually treated with antiprotozoan drugs and not antifungal drugs. They have a better effect on this particular fungus. Another opportunistic fungi is aspergillus, which causes aspergillosis. It's a really common airborne soil fungus. Now, there's lots of aspergillus species. There's only eight that cause human disease. And the most infectious is the aspergillus fumogatus. 
Now, those that have the weakest immune systems are gonna suffer from the worst side effects. Generally, healthy individuals might have allergy type symptoms. So if you've ever had you know, the hay fever type symptoms in the spring, might be the aspergillus, some type of mold spore, the aspergillus spore that you're breathing in and you're allergic to to give you those symptoms. On occasion, the toxins that the aspergillus can make can cause more severe side effects, but most often aspergillus causes a lot of seasonal allergies. Unless you are immunocompromised, then it can cause more severe cases because it can spread from the lungs. Um, it likes to grow in the lungs. That is how it's picked up. The interesting part, it really likes to colonize any empty spaces in the lungs. So if someone has had to, uh, TB, tuberculosis, and there's been damage in the lung tissue, aspergillus loves to get in there and fill it up and grow in there. Otherwise, it can grow in other places other than the lungs. It can get into the ear canals, the eyelids, the conjunctiva, and grow there as well. Again, it can also affect the lungs, causing pneumonia. It can affect the brain, the heart, other organs. So treatment, depending on what are your symptoms, what is this particular fungus affecting in the body. It could, you might need surgery, especially if you have to remove infected lung tissue. They probably are gonna give you a really strong antifungal like amphotericin B or voriconazole. And systemic, if it's affecting multiple body systems, you're usually given multiple antifungals in hopes that they'll all work together to try to kill this particular fungus. Now, as I said before a little bit with aspergillus, aspergillus is a big cause of fungal allergies. It's not the only one that can cause allergy type symptoms, multiple can. And so people that suffer from seasonal allergies and even asthma, uh, it's you're picking up these fungal spores that sometimes we call it as farmer's lung, tea picker's lung, bark stripper's disease. It's the fact that you are out there in nature and you're breathing in fungal spores and you're having allergy type symptoms. However, some fungal diseases or some fungal species can have or make toxins that if you ingest them or inhale them, they can cause more serious side effects. Aflatoxin, which can come from some of the aspergillus species, is toxic and even can be carcinogenic or cancer causing. And we can find this in some grains. We can find it in corn, in peanuts, and if any birds or livestock eat any of those that are infected, it can be deadly for those. So it's just another way that they can kill. It's not just all inhalation. Some of them can cause allergy symptoms and some of them can cause toxins. Now, my last two slides, this was not in your textbook, but I never feel like I can leave you with, you know, just the things that cause disease because there are fungi out there that cause poisoning symptoms. So these are ones that if you eat them, they're gonna cause poisoning symptoms. So, you know, there's, there's more types of fungi than just inhalation ones and skin ones. So these first three are all ones that you would pick up. You ingest them all. The first one, the Ammonida phylloids, also known as the death cap mushroom. There's Gyromitra esculenta, known as the false morale, and Cortinarius gentilis. Uh, and all of these will cause death, sometimes within two days because they all contain toxins that will destroy your liver. So it's just as a note, there, you know, there are mushrooms out there, they're all edible, <laughs> some only once. Uh, but we do have morales around our area. Maybe you've gone morale hunting or you know someone that has. There, so the gyrometra esculenta, it's, it's a false morale. So a couple of differences, which one, yes, you can definitely notice the color. A normal morale is always gonna be a white or a grayish tan color. A false morale is gonna have some orange or reddish color to it. Also, the inside of a regular morale is completely hollow. That's why they don't weigh very much. A false morale is always solid. So I'm like, there are some differences. Even the, the texture, this is a little more honeycomb, this is a little more bumpy. So I'm like, just to know, because I'm like, there are some false morales around. Don't just think, oh, I just found a really weird looking regular morale. No, don't eat it. <laughs> Only eat the grayish tan ones that are hollow on the inside. Because yes, they can and will cause death. 
a couple other mushrooms. Uh, these generally aren't going to kill you, but if you eat enough of them, they can produce hallucinations and convulsions, especially in children. So the psilocybe cubensis and ammonita muscaria. These are both, when people talk about shrooms, these are the shrooms. These are the ones that can cause um, psychological hallucinations and behaviors. Now, my couple notes on it, the most common one that's eaten for shrooms um, is the psilocybe. My only note, it is always grown on fecal matter. So just know it's grown on poop. And the ammonita is a unique one. It's around, it's rare. The in, the, it just has an interesting story to it. So it is, it does have a red cap to it and it has white spots all over it and it causes hallucinations. So there's a, kind of some backstory that goes with individuals that were eating these particular mushrooms were hallucinating and were envisioning someone wearing red, so wearing all red with a little bit of white on him. And depending on what season of the year, there is an individual that wears all red with a little bit of white. It's Santa. So the thought is that Santa originated from someone that was shrooming on this particular mushroom. Now, you'll notice around Christmas time, you'll actually see this particular mushroom all over on stuff. So you can actually see this mushroom, and I'm like, this red mushroom with white on it was Santa, or you can find Christmas ornaments with this particular mushroom. I found this article too, you know, eight ways that magic mushrooms explain where Santa came from. So, you know, fun little random factoid of where Santa came from is it all came from fungi. Uh, and someone that was hallucinating on eating this particular fungus. So I'll leave you with that fun story. And if you have any questions on any fungi in this PowerPoint, please send me an email.